Uh, yeah, let's get going. So, I'm waiting for my computer to finish restarting. Uh, I did an update. Ah, uh, okay. Okay, here it is. And meeting minutes. Here we go. Okay. So uh, if you have not added yourself to the agenda yet, please do so. Hey, Ed, can you uh, add me as well? Okay. And so events. So we now have three, well, we have two, three recurring uh, talks or uh, weekly meetings. We have this one every Tuesday. We have the NSM docs every Wednesdays. And we now have the NSM use cases, which has been moved from Friday to uh, Mondays, uh, every other Monday. Uh, so if if you are able to um, Ramki or Prem, are you online? Hey, Prem, yes, sorry, so I can mute. Yeah, if you, uh, so, if you're able to uh, fix and add the calendar onto this for your yes, weekly, yes, and it's uh, and it's every other week. Yes. Uh, so basically, it'll uh, overlap uh, with the uh, testbed call, the CNF uh, testbed call. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing is, if folks could, um, if you could update, push a, a patch to update the website. Currently, it shows on the community page on the website. Um, yes, uh, that will fix it, uh, definitely. Cool, cool. Awesome. Cool. So we have a uh, talk coming up. So this Friday will be uh, service mesh days, and let's see, I have the uh, schedule right here, so I will, I will post it. The service mesh days is March 28th and 29th. So the actual talk itself will be on, on the 29th. The 28th is comprised primarily of workshops. So if you are in town, um, that is definitely definitely consider uh, joining in. We also have the Intel out of the box network developer meetup, and that is during the afternoon on April 2nd. Um, and so we will have a 90 minute talk and hands on workshop that uh, people will be able to try. So it is the day right before, uh, right before ONS starts. And I'm grabbing the link to that right now. Cool. Uh, okay, and the link is uh, there. Cool. Great. So we also have ONS coming up of where we have Three, uh, three talks. One of them is the Intro to Network Service Mesh. We have a panel discussion uh, about using Kubernetes as a network service orchestrator. And we have a NSM and OpenStack integration um, th that we are doing in conjunction with Facila uh, at Ericsson. Um, I, Facila has told me that she may not be, that she's probably not gonna be able to show up so I may end up just giving the uh, the talk uh, on my own in this scenario, um, but she definitely did a lot to help in this scenario. So um, we have service provider uh, coming up with um, MPLS SDN and NFV event in Paris, April 9th to 12th. Quick question before we move on to that. Um, so sure. are we still on for the LFN demo booth stuff? Yes, uh, I mean, yes, Ed. so in fact, uh, 
I was just chatting with Nikolai uh, about certain issues. Um, awesome. So we have, I mean, we are fully into it. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Super cool. Cool. So yeah, stop by the Elephant booth and you can see ODL and Network Service Mesh in action. We also have a, uh, so I already mentioned about the uh, Paris event. So we have Container World coming up in April 7th, uh, 2019. Sorry, uh, Frederick, uh, just a quick interruption. Sure. Uh, I got to know that there is going to be an unconferencing uh, track uh, for, uh, for ONS. Uh, so just uh, uh, wondering, should we submit a talk? I'm just uh, pasting the link on the chat window. Um, so this is a good opportunity wherein this is more like a free flow discussion. If we want, we can probably leverage this. Yeah, that's a good idea. So um, do we want to do something with this towards uh, like just giving people to meet the community and use it as a, as a time to, uh, as it's a time for people to come and talk with us. Right, exactly. And also we can talk about, uh, it's a free flow. So if you click on the link, you'll see the schedule, there are uh, own app discussion, OPNFE. Um, so this is Elephant. So what we can do is we can probably uh, sh share it and at least uh, post it along with Open Daylight. Uh, and then we can probably open up to the audience and ask, I mean, we can have a free flow discussion. Yeah, that sounds good. Uh, Ed, are you up for that as well? Uh, yeah, it also occurs to me, by the way, I stuck in the link for the events page. So if we're going to do that, we want to make sure we list it on the events page on the website. The other thing is, we also need to figure out where and when we want to do the traditional NSM happy hour as well and get that updated on the website. But it looks like they've got, yeah, let, let's, let's put something for NSM in there. And, but I, I don't know necessarily want to do a talk so much as I think you said, just something free flowing, like an NSM boff, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, only caveat is I will just check since NSM is not technical under LFN, uh, I'll check with uh, Phil Rob to see if we can include it. We can probably add ODL and then uh, okay. we can do that. Yeah. For sure. I'll check. Yeah, they, in, um, in Europe, they had no. With us doing some uh, mm -hmm. uh, one, 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 this time. I don't. One quick question: the um, MPLS SD and NFE stuff. Do we actually have anything there um, at all for NSM, or should I remove it from our list of events at this time point since the CFP is passed? I think we. Sh well, is anyone going who is interested? I mean, I, I'm okay with removing it because we don't have anything that's NSM related that's that's in the event itself. Okay, cool. I, I have some colleagues who will attend, and I know that uh, Daniel Bernier from uh, Bell uh, is going to attend the MPLS World Congress, but uh, it could be an uh, open discussion about, uh, about uh, NSM, but uh, nothing official, I think. Okay, cool. Cool. So, uh, mid April, April 17th or 19th, we have Continue World with Prem giving a talk. On and uh, he's going to be talking on about network service mesh. We have KubeCon EU coming up with Barcelona, and um, so with that, yeah, let's go and remove uh, those particular ones. Uh, if if you are heading off, if you're heading over, make sure you book your hotel sooner than later, because the hotels have a tendency to yeah, but go up the hotel situation is is rapidly deteriorating. So, if you haven't booked your hotels, absolutely do. Um, I, I think we probably will have a couple talks and a happy hour and some other things going on there. Um, so, let me you'll, you'll give me a little bit of time. I'll, I'll get that information up here. Cool. Yeah, and um, if you end up missing it, uh, there is a really good transit system in Barcelona. Uh, the train leaves every five minutes or so. And so, so if you can, if you don't find somewhere near there, uh, get one that's near one of the uh, one of the trains. But just make sure that the line you're getting on is close to uh, is the, that your hotel is near the line that it's on, because otherwise you can do a few transfers. And um, 
We also, we also have a couple located events. We have the FIDO Mini Summit, and we have the, um, let's see, that one, the call for paper closes on April 5th. So if you would like to talk about, sorry, was did I get, did I get that wrong? No, uh, you're, so, yes. you're right, it's April 5th. Yeah, so if, you, um, so if you'd like to talk about, it, about MSM in the FIDO Mini Summit, then definitely, uh, definitely submit a talk. But is there a list of uh, accepted talk for the KubeCon related to NSM? Um, so the, we, we have a couple of slots that are available to us on the anticipation of us being a, a, a CNCF project. But the talks that we submitted, none of them were accepted. Um, this is actually not super surprising. Um, there's been a lot of stuff floating around Twitter where the, the kinds of talks that accepted tended to be fairly within a particular range of things that were well understood by the program committee, um, which is sort of par for the course for program committees. So I, I think you know, effectively what it comes down to is as we become more well known and understood beyond simply networking point, I think we'll do better there. But we, we will still have some things that keep coming. Yeah, the the CNCF uh, appears to actually reserve some slots for the, to, in order to help mitigate this. So uh, they hand out to things that they uh, that they think are useful, but that the community are not very aware of just yet. So, I mean, we, we, we should be good. I just need to get that sorted out. Um, So we have KubeCon in uh, Shanghai. Um, I don't think anyone submitted a talk for, uh, a talk for that though. So I'm inclined to, to clip it then, just because our events list is becoming unwieldy. Yeah, I agree. Let's remove it. Okay. And ONS Europe talks are the call for papers is already open. Um, we have a little bit of time before submitting in, so if you intend to talk there, uh, feel free to to do so, or feel free to engage us, and we'll help you put together a uh, uh, compelling uh, talk. Um, so this this part is unfortunate. We have MEF 2019 and KubeCon uh, North America on the same days, so. Uh, there is a there is a talk that has been or there's something submitted to MEF 2019. The call for paper for KubeCon has not been open yet. So, um, and with that, are there are there any other events that we need to talk about, or should we move on? All right. So, Ed, NSM CNCF proposal. So it is now in. Do you want to talk about it? Yeah, so the, the CNCF proposal's gone in. We have our two sponsors. Um, we're anticipating review for the proposal sometime in April. Um, now, the, the way I think this is currently going in the talk is they have normally the Technical Oversight Committee meets um, at 8 a.m. Pacific time on Tuesday mornings every other week, or actually the first and third, the first and third Tuesdays of the month. Um, I believe what they have done because they have a little bit of a backlog of projects is they have taken the Tuesdays at 8 a.m. that they normally don't meet, and they're now meeting at those times just to process project proposals. Um, and so I think that would mean that if we were to be scheduled in April, it would be either April 9th or April 23rd. Um, and because that is at the same time as the NSM community meeting, one of the things that we can decide what we want to do when we actually get a firmly scheduled time slot is do we want to simply cancel the NSM community call on that day and redirect folks towards the talk call uh, for the project review? So, uh, that makes sense, um, Ed. Um, and also one request, uh, can you share the final uh, submitted proposal? I know the link, you have the link, but it sort of has all the comments, the, the real grand finale. That link is actually to the final proposal right there. Oh, really? Ah. Yep, yep. That's the one that actually got pushed as a pull request. Oh, okay. Okay. Yep, yep. Yeah. So, um, is there value in, in showing up with, uh, with 
people in in numbers to the uh, to the meeting. I, I don't know necessarily that there's there's you know there, there, there's all kinds of different kinds of value that could come from that. I don't think there's value in the sense that it will influence one way or the other how the review goes. But um, you know, some of us will at least have to go and present it in that meeting, so we'll not be able to be here. And it might be the kind of thing that would be nice for the community to be there to witness. And for some people, I think there may be value there. Yeah, so I'm, I'm up for having it uh, canceled and for us to, to convene at the meeting itself. Uh, do we have an exact date yet? Uh, we don't. I'm currently working on the scheduling. Um, the sort of rough cut estimate that I got was probably sometime in April. Um, but that the, the scheduling is to a certain degree up to the talk, and I'm trying to get a clear picture of exactly all the ins and outs that go into that. Okay, that makes sense. Um, so, it, it, you know, it, it turns out that, that some of the more helpful people at CNCF have been in India the last week. Um, and between going, being there, and coming back, it's been a bit of a schlog for them. Yeah, I can see that because they have their first Kubernetes um, uh, days event in uh, in Bangalore, I think. Yep. Super exciting. Well, well, I th I think it's a good idea to uh, redirect the community call to the to the talk then. Um, and so if you'd like to come and uh, watch and so on, then definitely feel free to do so. So I believe that those talks are all, are all open. So there should be no issue with getting people in. Yep, I, I'm, anyone else have other opinions or thoughts? Uh, well, I think that, that, that the, the, the most, uh, I'd say, I mean, the core people should be there uh i mean in case there are you know some questions and things that, that that we can help so uh, effectively the call will be more or less obsolete i mean this world group call if they are long enough and so okay. i'm all about just moving there cool that makes sense cool all right so i think our next thing is just to get the time slot organized and then we'll um We'll put an announcement on here. Worst case scenario is uh, the announcement is done uh, less than a week before, in which case we will put a big banner on the top of this document saying, please, uh, please go to the other meeting. Sounds good. Um, okay, so we have a CNCF testbed uh, that we're starting to do some work with. So there's some stuff that needs to be done towards this. Um, actually, if, if anyone wants to help out with this as well, it's a e relatively easy task. Um, let me pull up the uh, the URL for it. Yeah, I think there there are, there's going to be an interesting meet in the middle here. I think because um, we're going to want to stand up the the chains of things in the CNF testbed as CNF as, as network service endpoints. And then I think there's some potentially interesting stuff around the um, the NUMA issues, the CPU pinning, um, those kinds of things that, that may be quite interesting work. Does that match your understanding uh, from the folks from the CNF testbed? I, you guys know that environment better than I do. That's, uh, yeah, that sounds about right. Um... I think we're trying to do this in multiple steps, um, help with the use case of using NSM with uh, OpenStack is one of the items, and then being able to use NSM as an option with uh, Kubernetes for use cases in general on the CNF testbed. And so we're going at that in several ways. There's quite a few tickets um, that are running right now related to this on, on that one. One of them is getting the V switch in the pod, which is actually completed um, and several other things that are related. That's just in a SIM related uh, tie in. But it, 
Now, Fred, about the uh, open stack in NSM. Yeah, I think what you just linked the two thirteen. Yep. Quick question. Uh, so you you do now have the V switch running in a pod, correct? Yes. Have you guys sorted out how you're handling the CPU pinning stuff? Are you still running everything in privileged containers, for example? Yeah, we're doing that in steps. Um, no, no, it, it has to be done. Yeah. In steps. It can't be done as a big bang. I completely agree. Yeah. Um, right now, it's the the testing is more on pure functional, and then as we add in the pinning, um, we'll deal with other stuff like performance whenever we get to that. But um, there's some items with Mellanox and the driver issues when we moved the V switch itself. So not the CNFs, but when we move the V switch into a pod, um, we have that working on Intel, but on Mellanox um, systems, the packet systems that have Mellanox NICs, uh, we saw some issues with the driver. So the okay. current, the current working code is with the Intel packet servers. Oh, that that's, that's okay. That's very good news. Okay, so if you've got it in a pod, <coughs> if the vSwitch is in a pod and you've got the Mellanox NICs, uh, you're using Intel NICs, then it should just be a relatively simple matter of getting, um, of getting everything turned into a network service input or a network service client to get NSM working in those test beds. And then, you know, everything else around CPU pitting stuff is things that have to be figured out in their own time anyway. So yeah, okay. No, this makes total sense. So we may want to break this part down at the item that's highlighted right now, that CNF testbed use of NSM. That wouldn't be 213. There's we probably need an epic or I'll create a project or something that contains all the tickets. That ticket 213 there is for using in a Kubernetes cluster that has NSM enabled, talking with the OpenStack cluster that's deployed using the CNF testbed code. So we should, we have, I guess, two efforts happening at the same time, adding NSM to the, NS, to the CNF testbed so that it can be used anytime with Kubernetes clusters. And then the other item is, um, that ticket 213, which is a Kubernetes cluster using, I believe it's all the make files and stuff that's currently used in NSM for deploying, a setting up a cluster, and then adding NSM to the cluster. Uh, okay, Let, let's not do it that way. So we now have Helm charts for NSM. And so I think probably our best bet is going to be using the Helm charts rather than the make file machinery. The make file machinery is delightful if you're a developer trying to work on NSM itself, but it's kind of vicious and awful if you're just trying to deploy the memory, which is why- Yeah, I was gonna, I was gonna bring up the same thing uh, after looking through the, uh, through the code. So the one area with the Helm charts is, I don't think that they're, well, they're not CI'd at the moment. So we, we need to start working on getting that stuff into the, uh, into the CI. Okay. Because we, we don't want to be breaking the CNCF testbed or, or others. Um, one thing that we that we could possibly that we could possibly do is uh, do we do we we, we want to do we want to make sure that the Helm charts uh, uh, work on a like we don't have to run them with every with every call. We could run them on on a nightly basis as well. So that way they would, they don't take too long. Yeah, I, I have been thinking about nightly builds. Uh, and uh, yeah, that was definitely one of the things that I was considering, like we just deploy a packet cluster. I mean, if, if we're talking about the current CI, just deploy a packet cluster and do home chart deploy just to verify that something is there and then maybe do some things, I don't know, uh, invoke the check scripts, something like that. Um, so the, so, the, one, yeah. the one thing I want us to think about when we do that, though, is um, is there are absolutely going to be things where they just take too long and we really get into things like nightly builds, and that's fine. That happens. Um, but I want to try and see if we can keep as much in the line of 
the incoming testing um, that's done on a per patch basis as we can get away with without bloating verify times to insane levels. Um, because that way we actually do know the world is in a good state at all times. So, <coughs> you know, that said, I don't think <sighs> as much longer than about 20 minutes end up being helpful. I think they actually start causing people to do crazy ass shit. Well, we are, we are a little bit over 20 minutes, I believe, today. And with some pending changes in the testing framework, we can very well go to, you know, 45, 50, something like that, which is not really... Uh, it, it, can, we, can we potentially parallelize some of the testing? <sighs> yep, maybe. I mean, we have some, uh, some patches... Uh, that are being prepared for having uh, a support for namespaces, which could allow us to run uh, different NS managers in different namespaces, which could eventually help. Like if we have unique namespaces for each of the tests, then they probably can be parallelized. We should, we should also talk about that because I would expect trying to run multiple network service managers in different namespaces. Um, so essentially multiple network service managers per node. There are a bunch of places that have to tread carefully for that to work properly. Um, yeah, of course, of course. So, um, <coughs> pardon me. So, no, okay, no, that, that, that's good, that's good. I, I mean, I, I sort of said my piece there, which is uh, life is full of trade off, and, and I think that's mostly it. Cool. All right, so. Um, one option that we potentially have as well is uh, to throw more hardware at it over time. Um, and I think the, the namespacing stuff will definitely help in another aspect. Uh, one option that we have is to spin up a, is when we spin up a cluster, uh, we could actually spin up a persistent cluster and uh, that avoids, uh, so we could, we could add and delete namespaces on the fly if we manage to get that to work. but. Uh, yeah, there's, there's a lot of work that we need to, to get in order to get us there. Um, and I'm not entirely sure whether that would um, meet the standard NSM practice in, in production. So yeah. there's, um, there's a question on that as well. I think that, that, that we're keeping this constantly deploying and uh, you know, destroying the uh, cluster for pricing purposes, like for just having Kind of price control on what we use. Um, I don't know. It's, is that so? Or yeah. So basically, it, what it comes down to is being a good citizen, um, mm -hmm. which is we we should try and strive to make sure that we're actually not consuming insane amounts of resources, mm -hmm. um, and that we what we're doing we're actually consuming it in an efficient way. Right. So right now, I think if memory serves. Um, when we when a CI run occurs, we start up two of the smallest um, yep. instances that yep. Packet offers, and I think that runs us seven cents per instance. So we've got a total of fourteen cents cost to run a, a CI run, yeah, which is not bad. Uh, if we were to double that to twenty eight cents, um, you know, presuming that we were actually you know doing something useful with it, like parallelizing our testing, um, I, I wouldn't think that's an egregious of resources. I think that the next um, actually available instance is um, about 40 cents, so it's more than double. Oh, no, but I mean, the thing is, if we're going to parallelize tests, you really want to spin up two new instances. Uh, spin up another ah, one. I see, I see. Uh, uh, oh. running, running on bigger instances doesn't really help us parallelize, but running on, you know, if, instead of running one cluster, if we were to run two clusters, for example, which meant we could parallelize the test running. Um, uh, that that's a fairly marginal cost shift. Um, you know, quite frankly, I'm I'm much more concerned about figuring out why we occasionally have zombie instances. Yeah, we do. That that's the that's something I'm much more concerned with than the notion of starting up a second cluster. Um, yeah, but we, we do want to be listen. Uh, the CNCF and Packet have been super nice to us about all of this. Yeah. Um, but more than anything else, I, I tend to be someone who thinks in the world in terms of value. Um, back, in the, back in the good old days when I first joined Cisco, uh, one of the core values the company used to espouse was frugality. 
And they were super, super, super clear about the fact that frugality had nothing to do with how much money you were spending. It had to do with taking care to maximize the value for the money you were spending. Okay. So, and I, I think that's a good thing to keep in mind here. A quick question, you would mark this in progress, the VVVV switch in a pod thing, Taylor. Does that mean that we haven't yet quite got the new switch in a pod? Taylor? Uh, so the testing with, um, I think the last thing was enabling hyper-threading on one of the Intel, quad Intel machines. Mm -hmm. That was yesterday so that we could um, increase basically for all the, the test cases that we're trying to validate. We couldn't deploy as many um, CNFs. Oh, okay. It's, it's okay. working. We, we want to do more of the testing. Okay, no, that, that, that's super useful to know that detail. Because again, that, that makes the next step that we would do for getting CNF, you know, NSM working for the CNF test bed. You know, once that piece is running in a pod, that next step gets much simpler, much, much simpler. So that's super good to know. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I, one quick uh, comment here on the CPU pinning of the CNFs or even the vSwitch. Uh, as you guys understand, the NUMA affinity will be associated to the physical NIC as well. For example, the Intel NIC that's been discussed here, you know. So on a test bed point of test bed point of view, I was thinking, you know, uh, we should have a NIC per NUMA node. Uh, you don't need to have it on day, day one itself, but the final test bed probably should have a NIC uh, per NUMA socket. And that's that'll be the right testing for the various CNFs uh, running on each of the socket. Yeah, the, the, you're, you're absolutely correct about like what makes for good results. Um, there, there's an ongoing set of interesting questions in Kubernetes around how to handle um, the NUMA affinity of things. Um, and and it, it's the, 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 the very short version of this is it is not going to ever work the way that it worked in something like OpenStack, where you just do very fine granular mapping of stuff. That's never going to be acceptable in the Kubernetes community. That's the bad news. The good news is that there are things in progress in Signode and Resource Management Working Group for actually allowing you to get what you need without doing that fine level of granularity of NUMA mapping. Um, and those are hopefully going to land in one Kubernetes 1.15. And I would expect the CNF testbed would want to take advantage of that. Did that answer at all some of what your comment was? Yes. Um, um, my experience is surely coming from the OpenStack side. So yeah, that granular pinning was required and was done. Uh, but here, if the flexibility or if, 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 it, if it's not going to be so granular or strict in pinning, I understand, you know, um, but ability to exit out of the right NIC um, uh, as a policy might also be a good thing to th think about. One thing to keep in mind too is in June, AMD's drop in the ROM um, architecture. So the actual silicon underneath all of this is about to get some drastic updates. Um, AMD and Intel are going in drastically different directions, but Intel's going to give you the ability at the hardware level to kind of customize what your NUMA zones look like. And then AMD is coming up with this, like, I forget what they call it, but it's basically a distributed box across all the different dyes spanning the different sockets. And even within the same socket now, if you so decide to, you can like carve it up to, I think, a total of like 16 NUMA zones, or you can just take advantage of the distributed bus and just say all sockets are one NUMA zone. And so like, I think when we get to maybe around this fall, even how DBDK consumes these architectures and stuff will be different and it'll give us the ability even at the hardware level to kind of tune, therefore not forcing Kubernetes into awkward positions because it can be basically ignorant of all this stuff that's going on in the actual hardware itself. That would be super nice. By the way, if you have friends in AMD Landia, uh, you need to encourage them towards the Kubernetes community to make sure that things work out in a way that's good for them if they have different architecture. Um, yeah, I think I've got some <laughs> slides. I'll try to track them down. But um, the Rome architecture is very unique in the sense that they are getting away from like the NUMA madness. And um, they're saying, we're going to homogenize all this. You're going to pay a penalty, but it'll be 
minor, and we think that the ease of use overcomes the small bit of, like, we're talking nanoseconds of latency here. Yeah, no, I mean, if that actually works out, which I'm hoping it does, uh, then that would greatly simplify life because the Newman madness is kind of awfully painful, particularly in Kubernetes. Um, no, so the, 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 the comment earlier um, about the, the OpenStack way of doing things, the reason I mentioned the difference with Kubernetes is absolutely if you're coming from the OpenStack side, you're used to granularly specifying on what this thing running on this core, which is on that Numa zone, because that's where the NIC is. In Kubernetes, it's a little bit more, um, I have this thing that wants this NIC and Kubernetes figures out that that NIC would really rather that things who are using it were running in this Numa zone. And so does its level best to schedule any cores for that pod into the Numa zone of the device that it's trying to consume. Does that sure. make sense? Yeah, um, makes sense. The yeah, the the placement of the CNF, yeah, that makes sense, Ed. Uh, and that happens in OpenStack as well. It's just that uh, you need, to, there are a few detailed scenarios, you know, maybe it will be deviating the meeting today, but there are detailed scenarios where you want to make sure that the traffic enters to the right physical NIC uh, so that, you know, the receive path is optimized for the CNF. Uh, the placement of the CNF is, is one issue. And how to steer the traffic towards the right NUMA in a server, mm -hmm. uh, which has multiple NICs, uh, that is another problem. Yeah, no, the, the, the unfortunate problem with the current solution, as I understand it, for NUMA zones and Kubernetes, is that it has a couple of sort of presumptions that aren't stated. And one of those presumptions is that a single pod is only, is only going to really be interested in a single NIC, um, because it doesn't really have a good solution for the, I have you know, NIC zero in, on socket zero and NIC one on socket one, and I have a CNF that wants to use both, it really has no meaningful solution for that problem. Sure, and, and I think as Jeff was pointing, you know, the CPU architectures are evolving and changing, right? I think it might be a good idea to have, put the boundary with the vSwitch, yep. uh, and the CNF doesn't care, and the, if we have to add any NUMA awareness or some intelligence, you know, that can be in the vSwitch layer rather yep. than the CNFs worrying. Uh, uh, but, uh, but we do want a mode where we want to avoid this inter-socket communication, right? That buses the bottleneck, correct? I mean, we do want a mode where like... Yes, uh, so, so Ramki, uh, there... Oh, the yes, saying, uh, like, right. like, I mean, the full vertical alignment, right? Yes, so, yes. I mean, that's what I'm saying, though, like, the, the way that you picture the that in AMD, at least in Rome, and potentially in Intel, that's going to change. Like, instead of a QPI, you're now going to have, like, just this distributed bus that spans both sockets and all the different dies inside of each socket. So, I mean, at least on the AMD side, now that they're moving back into the enterprise class server market, like, they are not going to do NUMA from the standard of, you know, this memory lane with this PCIe lane with this socket all go like this. And I've now had to cross the QPI two times and added X, Y, and Z latency. Like some of that is going to be abstracted. Um, some of it's going to become more complicated depending on how you decide to carve these up in the BIOS. So uh, it, it's going to be some exploration and it's not going to be the, you know, x86 we've known for the last several years of, I want to get everything into one vertical so that this memory lane comes out of the same socket as the PCIe lane that I pin this VNF um, to. So the just that is spot on. So the only so one thing we have to keep in mind is the transition to newer processes is, is uh, I mean a slow transition all day. So basically the existing architectures right will there be that for a while. I mean at least from what we have seen right. So we need to sort of be able to support both. Yeah. So. so yeah, so Ramki, the execution of the CNF on a core, which is associated with NUMA, you're right. We need to have an opinion, the placement part, right? What I was trying to say was the CNF, the, it exiting out of the server uh, via a particular NIC, that can be hidden behind the vSwitch. Uh, you know, we got to divide the problem into two pieces. Um, the, the networking, the exit and entry point uh, to reach uh, the container, is one aspect and placement of the container is another aspect, right? Uh, so there's, there's another yeah, part to that too, right? Because keep in mind too, like, and this is, goes to Ed's point, we've got to decide how 
convoluted and complicated will ultimately make this. Because if you build a CNF as multiple services in separate pods and use something like Mimith, are you going to try to force that all of the pods that are co-located are all within the same like memory address space? Like so that way those internal memory interfaces don't have to cross the QPI, or is it going to be the potential that you know socket ones, you know, six lanes, like first pod gets scheduled here, second pod is scheduled in the other one, even though those are vertically aligned, you're now still crossing the QPI based on MIMIF because Absolutely. where this information ultimately lives. So, I mean, we're going to have to like, like uh, tease this out and not want to get too bogged down because we'll just recreate all of the headache that OpenStack gave us. Yeah, so I think, I think it's nothing to do with OpenStack, Jeff. It's just about the, the VNF or CNF being a very fat instance and is spanning across sockets so that uh, but you're right you know that kind of low level details uh, the nsm shouldn't worry about um, yeah. that's why i was also kind of indicating that maybe we can solve it under the v switch layer uh, if 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 a complexity is needed there you know uh, yeah. not that i'm saying that we should go and solve all these issues no, so, so this is actually so this has been super interesting and useful i do want to move on because we've got some other things on the agenda but one comment i'll make in closing is that what, we're, what we've mostly been talking about here is essentially a pod placement problem at the end of the day um and the good news is network service mesh that's not what it actually does so we have an interest as a community in how this gets solved in signode in the resource management working group and i would highly encourage folks to participate in those spaces um and we certainly care but that's not specifically our problem to solve. It's a problem we very much need to have solved, but it's not going to get solved in NSM. Um, so, um, uh, one request yet. So, uh, the ENSM is a very common hot topic for the upcoming ODL demo, like our next talks and, uh, you know, the uh, ONS around panels, because there is always a, I mean, ENSM means one app interaction. I also see sort of the open stack VM interaction, right? Yeah, Can yeah. we talk about that? And so I think what you're saying is, could we could we trigger the agenda uh, the agenda uh, priorities so that we talk about the ENSM now because we're running out of time? Yeah, I, I much appreciate. We have some slides to. Uh, we had some good discussion on the uh, use case uh, call yesterday, and we have some updated slides actually. Yeah, we'll go if, through those. If everybody else is okay. I'm happy to do that. Um, is, does anyone have something else on the agenda they'd like to see at higher priority than that? I think uh, this is good. Let's. I would just uh, like to say one sentence. So uh, for the upcoming release date, they stay the same. So end of April 23rd, as we planned, I am going to do and send a PR to update the site with a proposal uh, for a table to, to reflect yeah. that. Yeah, if you could, if you could do that, and if you could just insert in the meeting notes the the, the salient dates, because I remember having. Yeah, them. yeah, I will, I will. I don't remember what they were, which is part of why I dumped that. Yeah, yeah. So. I am, I am, I am. Okay, let's go. <laughs> Many thanks. Cool. Would you like to share, Ramki? Yes. Thank you. Ed. Yeah, I'm gonna. My pleasure. Okay. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Excellent. So, so if, uh, in yesterday's use case call, we had a very good discussion. Um, uh, what uh, Nikolai pointed to was like, uh, Ed, uh, you, several folks had kicked off a very nice document on ENSN. So what Prem and I did was sort of took it and then uh, summarize some of our key discussion points, right? Just oh, around that's, ENSN. That's, that's fabulous. Steal from me. Steal everything from me. That's exactly what they're <laughs> Thanks. It, 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, thank so you. Just to add, so, uh, just to I'll, get, uh, I'll get straight to uh, ENSM here. So basically, the nice picture. So basically, you had some. So just to add text. to, just to add to Ramki, it is a need of the hour. Ed, we are struggling a bit with ODL, so that's one of the reasons here. Okay. Yeah, sorry, Ramki. Um, yeah. Um, so the key message here is ENSN is a date pair external controller function as depicted very nicely here, right? So basically on the northbound side, it speaks the NSM protocol, right? Yep. Uh, here on the southbound, it speaks equipment specific APIs. That's what is ENSM about, right? It, exactly. Okay. It speaks whatever the hell, right? It's not our business. Yeah. <laughs> so now 
So what they did was essentially took this and then mapped out certain specific scenarios. We'll walk through them. So yeah. one case is essentially, I mean, we wanted to start small, not blow it up, uh, you know, drive through examples. What he said was, let's take one case, uh, you know, SRAOV, unique VLAN per VF, so complete hardware slicing, right, complete. Where essentially what we're really saying is uh, a hardware in this topology, hardware port is already nailed on node, uh, already nailed on a specific node and PNF. I mean, basically the port is known where traffic is coming from. Everything is known, predetermined. And uh, what happens is ENSM, in this case, the key to note is ENSM exposes one and only one endpoint, right? Correct. And if you look at the control flow, uh, NSM uh, requests, when NSM requests ENSM, ENSM assigns the VLAN ID. In this case, we are talking still VLAN. Very, very simple. Yeah, right? yeah. And then um, in this example, we said, let's let it assign VLAN ID 100, and VLAN ID 100 gets programmed in the data plane on both sides, right? On this side, on the NSM side, on the pod, and also on the PNF, right? Yep. So far, so good, very simple. So now enters a little more complex scenario. Uh -huh. So here, what we're saying is there is no SRAOV, right? Correct. I mean, a more, um, yeah, interesting one, no SRAOV. Uh, of course, hardware port is already nailed on the node and PNF. And same thing, ENS, the key is ENSM exposes only endpoint still. So basically, as you can see, you have two functions to deal with from ENSM side, the gateway and the PNF, right? Okay. Correct. But ENSM, as far as the ENSM goes, it still exposes one and only one endpoint. Uh -huh. So the first step here is essentially establishing a tunnel between the uh, pod and the gateway. That's the first step, right? Where ENSM assigns that VXLAN ID, right, for the tunnel, right? I mean, other uh -huh. necessary. So what you do is then, as at the end of it, you create this tunnel between the pod and the gateway, right? Correct. And uh, and <coughs> as far as the pod goes, you have no idea that you're connecting to the gateway, by the way, right? It's all completely abstracted. Oh, you're connecting to something. Exactly. It, it has no idea what's happening. It doesn't even know there's a PNF on the other end. And that is correct. Yes. Yes. Um, in fact, I, uh, yeah, we can study this picture and maybe putting a whole box around this. I think that will send a better message. I'll uh, do that. I, like, I think that may be a good idea. And there are some boxes in some of the more recent slides that are sort of like nice color coded. This is a network service stuff. And, and it may even be the case that your gateway box here lives inside the, the physical network function in some cases, right? All it's really doing is terminating the tunnel, correct? That is correct. Exactly. But yeah, but I, uh, but that's, uh, I thought it would be good to dis, uh, depict a disaggregated scenario and uh -huh. put a box around this, right? Yeah, we'll do it. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Communicating is hard. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so next. So once you have done the VXLAN creation, so now goes the second part, right? So it's not over it. So now you are using that VXLAN tunnel to signal the VLAN ID end to end, right? Correct. More interesting. So basically what you're doing is you're still talking to ENSM always. So now uh, ENSM assigns uh, VLAN ID. So basically you fix the VNI. Remember you fix the VNI. You know which color you're going, right? Now you're generating a VLAN ID uh, 100 for that VNI, right? That's what ENSM gives out, right? And interestingly enough, you have to remember that, hey, from here you're sending VLAN ID 100, VNI 1000 goes here, right? And then the gateway could do any translation. You have no idea what it could translate to. It could but translate basically. None of, our business. none of our business at all, agreed. Correct. But I, I mean, but I thought it would be very cool to show the end to end, uh, to show, I mean, uh, a real deployment scenario, right? Yep, 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 yep. No, I, I, I get that. Um, one thing to keep in mind as we look at this, um, and that this, is, this is something that's super counterintuitive because we're used to thinking about things like BNIs, um, particularly as point to multi-point concepts. And so they end up being quite a bit scarcer. Um, the, the truth of the matter is that when you look at that original tunnel, uh, look, if we, let's bounce back to slide five really quickly because it's easier to explain there. It's a simpler slide. The, if you bounce back to sl slide five, um, that tunnel is actually not parameterized by a VI. That tunnel is parameterized by a source IP, a dust IP, and a VNI. 
Those are the three yeah. parameters that uniquely specify that tunnel. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. The reason this is super interesting is that the space of VNIs from which you must select a VNI is not the global space of VNIs. It's the space of VNIs between that source and dest IP. Um, That's correct. And that ends up making the problem much simpler because the multiplicity of things you have available is enormously larger. And so the likelihood that you would have to do something like add additional layers like VLAN tags along that tunnel is much smaller. Not saying it doesn't happen. I'm sure there will be cases where it happens, but but the likelihood is much smaller. In, the uh, so in fact, Ed, uh, I was thinking to this, and another question came to my mind. So in fact, that was one of the related topics. So basically, so the key is essentially this is very akin to sort of the MPLS uh, label allocation strategy. If you go back to MPLS, so basically uh, it assigns uh, the downstream router will assign the label, right? Very similar, right? So so now. In that scenario, of course, if you, the MPLS world, so what happens is each router is supposed to full-blown HA, right? Have, so basically, uh, you can, you know, be assured that it's highly available because each, I mean, imagine, uh, imagine very simple, you're talking to the gateway, which is a router as an example, right? And that implements your ENSM, it's got HA functionality, right? So for example, if one a control plane, uh, unit goes down, then you have the backup control plane to make sure that, you know, uh, things are stable, right? Uh, from sort of a control plane uh, label exchange, or in this case, ID exchange perspective. But if you come here, uh, what happens is like, basically, we are letting the node, like you said, to your point, assign the labels, like basically, it's all of local significance. But the question is, uh, what if that node goes down? I mean, we have HA, but of course at a global Kubernetes cluster level, not at a node level, right? Yep, so yep. how do we handle such scenarios, right? Well, so, so um, think of it this way. Um, effectively, the way we've handled it today, the, the current resiliency story is, if I'm a network service client and I have a connection that takes me somewhere, right? And I don't really know what happens inside that connection. I just show packets in and they come out the other end and vice versa. Um, if the network service endpoint that I am talking to goes away, right, the particular instance goes away, um, what network service mesh will do today is it will attempt to auto heal. And what auto healing means is that it attempts to go and establish a connection to a new network service endpoint um, that, provides the same, that, that, that provides the same network service and has the same network service selection criteria um, in the hopes that things will be more or less okay. Now, when I say more or less okay, let's be super clear. If the network service endpoint was stateful, something like a stateful firewall, unless the guy who wrote the, the, the stateful firewall wrote it so that state could be shared among replicas, you're going to have some state loss there. But network service mesh will auto heal those connections to whatever the network service endpoint is. So that there is resiliency built into the system there, definitely. So the, the point to note here, it is like the ID itself, right? So basically, uh, let's let's go to this very simple example, right? This simple example, uh, even simpler. So basically, the ID is like you have some running ID generation here, 100, 101, et cetera, right? And then this function goes down, correct? So basically, this is the one doling out IDs. So uh -huh. you, and this was the one managing these IDs, right? Correct, uh -huh. this VLAN ID space. So now... Uh, and then now this node connects to some other node and moves ahead, right? So okay. basically, uh, then that will start giving out IDs from a different space, right? Not necessarily these numbers, correct? And that this, very well this, yes. yes. Go ahead. Uh, so there, it's just that probably we have to work out the scenarios, how this is all going to line up, right? I mean, basically, like, hey, uh, this gave out, like, say, 100 to 200. Now, this region is, uh, that region is unusable, right, from the spot perspective, because, you know, that function, that node died, and then now it connects to a new node. We have to see what that new range, it, that doles uh, out, right, correct, so which may not be the same. Let me ask the simple question here. In this picture, who do you think is assigning the VLAN ID? The ENSM is assigning the VLAN ID. Okay, good, correct. good, 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 good. That's, that's my understanding as well. It's always good when we share the same understanding. And you're saying yeah. if ENSM goes down, then the, the next place that someone tries to connect to 
may be a different ENSM, which may have a different set of VLAN IDs that it's allowed to manage within this context. Um, That's correct, yes, exactly. It may completely different range, yes, yes. <coughs> yeah, and, and the way the current auto healing would work um, is essentially the pod still has its kernel interface. The cross connect to the tunnel would just change, right? So as long as it is the case that the other ENSM does whatever has to happen to the physical network, such that now let's say a VLAN ID 200 is assigned, goes to the same or an equivalent uh, physical network function, the pod never sees any of that. The pod literally never sees the VLAN ID, right? It doesn't know. Yeah, ideally it should never see a VLAN ID. It yep. should just deal with the vSwitch locally. I, I do apologize. I, I, we're running up against the top of the hour. Yeah, I, so uh, what yeah. I'm saying is these are all like, it, it can get a little tricky depending on different scenarios, right? I mean, basically in some, there may be a vSwitch or there are SREOV cases. This is some details you have to really work out how this is all going to come together. Because typically, uh, how this is all handled, it's all through some global ID management, right? But, yeah. Which is basically taking into account all the policies. If you... Uh, recall, we are discussing the use cases, right? It, in some cases, we are assuming like, hey, these are all point to point. Some it's a little, uh, sim I mean, slightly different from that. Yes, yeah, so right. Naki, is your proposal to is your proposal that the downstream guys should allocate, and that's a better model, and it's kind of takes a page out of the MPLS. Yeah. So I'm also, I'm, I would Sorry, love to think gonna... slightly beyond just a simple downstream allocation because. So the point to note is like uh, if we, no matter what we do, right, even if we do like a point to point allocation, we are reserving VNI sort of from a node vSwitch perspective, right? And uh, we have to see the global effect, at least to my mind, I don't think we have worked out all the scenarios, you know, when uh, things go down, how, uh, how the ID management is going to happen across... We're going we're to have to cut it short at the moment because we're already five minutes above and we're ho we're holding people back at the moment. So uh, can you add this to uh, to the meeting notes for um, for next week and we can continue the discussion? Yep. Yep. Cool. Thank cool. you so much. Thank you very much. These are super good things for you to bring up, Ramki. They are things we need to walk through. Um, I, I think at the end of the day, they don't end up being tricky. They're just the things that make them simple are super unfamiliar. And so it's really important to talk through and make sure we got them nailed down. No, exactly. That's what I was, because you're getting to the next level of detail on implementation, right? Want to make sure this is all uh, fully understood and nailed down, uh, including what are the different strategies for handling, you know, these complex policies around, uh, you know, isolation and all those. All right. Cool. cool. Take care, everyone. Uh, see you all next week, same time. Thank you.